Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and every Thursday in September, we will cover performing arts organizations, issues, and leaders. And today, we are starting with special guest, Anwar Nasir, Executive Director at the Louisiana Philharmonic Orchestra in New Orleans. Anwar, I'm so pleased to have you on. We've been trying to get you on the show for... I think at least three quarters of a year. Or so <laughs> you've given us a great gift. So so thanks so much. Thank you for having me. I'm I'm thrilled to be here. So first of all, New Orleans is the musical town, right? I mean, it's the heart of jazz. It's the heart of these amazing traditions. The the uh, you know zydeco and uh, bounce, which is a, a you know a a uh, a new uh, phenomena, the whole issue of the blues and, oh my God. Now, yeah. I have to say that when I think of New Orleans, I don't think of symphonic music. So <laughs> correct me, correct my thinking. <laughs> well, you know, what's what's interesting here is, you know, obviously New Orleans is, is very well situated, I think, in, in the American history, American tradition. You know, no, no state came into the union as as epic and triumphant as Louisiana, right? So when you when you think about what happened and how we got here, there is there is all kinds of influences that have come to the city and to this region that have put together this wonderful tradition. So originally when you when you think back to like late 1600s, early 1700s, when symphonic music, orchestral music was really starting to become a thing, there was a huge influence from immigration immigrants coming into this country through this region. So a lot of there was a, there was a time where uh, there were multiple opera houses here in this in the city and in the state. And of course, you can't have opera without having an orchestra. So really thinking through there were I think they were doing something like 300 performances a, a year um, of opera, orchestral music, dance, because of the influence that you had from the French, from the English, from the Spanish, and really knowing that influence that has come here and it has been rooted here for all of that time. I think someone had a really savvy marketing plan when it came time for jazz and came time for blues and a lot of these other ways of really influencing and saying what the culture of New Orleans, Louisiana is, because that's what we uniquely had. But the, the tradition of orchestral music, classical music, has been in this region for a very long time, and we're happy to keep, can, you know, carrying the torch forward. Well, and the thing about that I find to be so fascinating is how orchestral music, how symphonic music, was appropriated and then evolved. In which the 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 sections of an orchestra uh, that uh, where the instruments were more transportable, where the instruments were less expensive to acquire and they could be developed further, they were appropriated and, and taken. Those segments of the music were taken and then changed. And that's one of the things that I think is so fascinating. The, the whole tradition in uh, New Orleans and Louisiana of marching bands, right? Which mm. you would never have a marching orchestra, but no. what, what, is, <laughs> what is a marching band except for a section of the orchestra that's on, on foot? And Absolutely. Also, Absolutely. And you, and you think that there are even some instruments that are, are based on orchestral instruments that have been adapted specifically for a marching band. Uh, like I think about like, say, for instance, like a mellophone is a marching French horn. Same, you know, same, uh, the same approach to playing. It makes it a very similar sound, but it's very much geared towards just this specific use case, which I think as we look to uh, the history of our instruments and what we get to do is that there are very specific periods of instruments that are, or period instruments that are played for this type of music. So we like to ebb and flow and you get to really see that there's a, a good balance here and we come together in a, in a fun way and we all get to play together in the street. So it's a, it's a really fun thing to be able to do. Talk about the idea of technique as well. This whole mm -hmm. idea of, for example, bending a note, right? Mm -hmm. In traditional European music from the 1700s, 1800s, you didn't take notes and bend them the way you bend them today, right? You didn't take the improvisational piece mm -hmm. and explicitly improvise. Although, even in those days, right, improvisation is part and parcel of, of the artist's uh, craft. But now it's been taken into a totally different level, which now can then inform this ancient music that came from Europe over to the United States. Can you talk a little bit about how 
the various traditions, the rhythms, for example, that were quite unusual and quite unaccustomed in European music inform your repertoire. And then let's talk about your repertoire and exactly how you engage modern audiences with this, uh, with this older uh, art form. Yeah, absolutely. I think that when, when we think about the core orchestral repertoire, like you said, it's it's very structured and, and regimented uh, and how it's performed. And of course, there's a little bit of artistic license that is taken from conductor to orchestra and easy, as you go around the country and around the world. But one thing that we've seen is that as more and more people get invited into this space and it becomes more, I, I don't want to say worldly because it's been worldly for a very long time, but I think that where our approach to the way that we listen to, consume, and even play music has evolved over time. You know, things are, things are, it's, it's meant to be living, right? It's, it's not, it, it you know, when, we, when it was originated, there were no recordings, right? So it was always living, breathing, evolving, and changing. And one thing that I think that people don't recognize and hold on to is that, you know, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, these these, you know, symphonies and overtures, concertos were always being tinkered with. They, you know, like very few people got it right the first time. And there was going to be a little bit of evolvement, a little bit of evolving, a little bit changing. And, and that's okay. So one thing that happened when, especially around, you know, here in New Orleans and Louisiana, when jazz started to come into place, like you said, there were uh, instruments that were getting introduced in new ways. People were hearing different things. And and specifically with jazz, it starts from a home base and then it veers off a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, and then you come back home. And and, and we know that that's, a, that's the basic structure of how, how a symphony symphony works, right? You kind of expose your major themes in that first, you know, in the first movement, then the second movement, you're going to veer a little bit away. Third movement is going to be a little bit different than that. And then you're going to bring it all back together at home again. So it's, it's a lot of that same structure that's in there that we see and the music that's performed, that was performed and originated here. That's, that has its home base, I would say in orchestral music, but it has evolved and it has grown and it's changed because the people, their life, their life experience and the way that they approach it and their influence has allowed us to really see things in a different way, which I think is really fantastic. So to be an orchestra here in New Orleans is really, really wonderful because we get to do this we get to do this thing where we get to play around with different musical styles, different traditions, and it allows us to come back and really play the core repertoire in a great way. Uh, so I, I think that it's a wonderful experience for our musicians um, and anyone that gets to come in and hear the uh, Louisiana Philharmonic here in New Orleans, is a, they're in for a treat always because it's we do a lot of things really, really well, which I think is really a way for us to distinguish ourselves in the market. So Beethoven li lived 300 years ago. If Beethoven is performed in Louisiana, in your in your orchestra, is it different than if it's if it's uh, if it's performed in New England? I would say it's it's a little bit different because the the audience expectations are different. Now, what one thing that that I know and uh, and that I think that I hear from our audiences a lot is how you how you bookend the pieces matter, right? So it's not like you can just plop in a you know a Beethoven seven and think that it's going to, uh, it's going to stand really well on its own, but what are you doing with your overture? What are you doing with your concerto? What are you doing with your encore? If you're going to have one and how do you want your audience to perceive that piece of music at that time? And it allows us to really have a space where you can help curate the, the performance in a way, you know, it's not always wash, rinse, repeat uh, of the same thing. We like to say, okay, well, we did it this way last time. How do, what do we want? How do we want to walk them into the hall tonight? How do we want them to hear and get ready for this Beethoven? And so what do we want to connects, away with. This connects to your field, right? You came up through the marketing line. You came yes. up market, uh, through audience engagement. So what you're saying is it's not just a matter of, of what is on stage. Mm -hmm. It's how you allow the audience to approach the stage, to approach the piece, mm -hmm. to engage them even before they come into the hall. And then once they're in the hall, it's that whole overarching experience what is it like now with you being the executive director versus you being the marketing director? Are you having the kind of, of conversations that you craved as a marketing director now with your artistic director in which you're basically saying, OK, you're representing the art. I'm representing the audience. Let's mm -hmm. come together and create an experience that's just amazing. Are you having those conversations today? Absolutely, absolutely. So I, I would say one of the one of the draws for me to want to get into the, the role that I sit in specifically is being able to have some power and some influence over what it is that we get to do as an organization. So that was one of the main draws for me to to want to sit in this chair. But 
So we have a, a really fantastic model here in, in Louisiana where um, we're collaboratively operated, right? So our musicians, our music director, our staff, uh, all and our, our trustees, our board of trustees as well, all get to contribute into what it is that we're going to do as an organization. And we do this day in and day out. Um, so the interesting part about it is that I get to be able to represent, like I said, the audience, what we want to, um, what we want to be able to hear and experience, and what it gets to feel like. Because I'm, you know, more often than not talking with a lot of our, like a lot of our patrons. I'm walking them into the hall. I get to get to connect with them, and you know, so when they like something, they'll they'll tell me about it. But when they don't like something, they'll tell me about it even more, which is really <laughs> really helpful. Um, but then we get the perspective from the musicians as well to say, you know, I really like when we put these things together, and I and we'll get to pull on some threads there and say okay, well, when you say that, you know, you like this overture, this concerto and this symphony together, what exactly does that feel like? And what does that, what does that mean for you artistically? And then it helps us be able to go back and say to the audience that when you're here and listening to our musicians, that this is why this music is important, right? Because it becomes more than just notes on the page that they're playing. They're wanting to make sure that this is an experience for all of us together. Um, so it, it really builds out this ecosystem and, and it's, it's really helpful for us as an organization to think about things much more holistically than just like, all right, we want to play this, this, and this. Okay, go. And uh, sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't, but we always have to think about all of the pieces to the puzzle. You know, is it going to make sense at the box office? Is it going to make sense for our audience? Are we serving our core audience? Are we trying to serve a new audience? And we can do all of these things at the same time. We just have to be very thoughtful about it. And is it serving the musicians as well? So that's always a part that I like to include. So people have been talking in the symphony world and the classic arts world in general about younger audiences, about more diverse audiences. Talk with talk with us about um, what does your audience look like? Who mm -hmm. are your audiences? Who Who is coming into the hall? Who is buying tickets over and over and over again? How old are they? What Absolutely. kind of what kind of uh, of uh, ethnic profile does your audience have? Yeah. So what's what's interesting here, and, and I've been working in orchestras for about the last ten years or so, and I've been able to, and I've been in three different parts of the country. This is my third orchestra that I've been a part of, and it's been really fascinating to me to see that there's a core audience that exists for you know core symphonic repertoire. So we're talking about the Beethoven's, the Tchaikovsky's, the Brahms and the Bach and Mozart and those, you know, those guys. But then I, I feel really fortunate that the orchestras that I've been a part of have seen their view as being much more broad than just, you know, preserving this music that has been a part of our tradition for a long time. It's about- So like, it's not just this? repetition of what you it's already- It's not know. just repetition of what we've already done. How can we push, how can we push things forward? I think about my time when I was with the Los Angeles Philharmonic and, you know, during our, our centennial celebration, Celebration, we said, we're going to commission 50 new works um, to be performed over the course of the season. And we ended up somewhere about 52 to 54. And that was really, really like eye-opening for me as, a, as an arts administrator to think like, all right, we committed to this and we said we're going to do it. And we didn't have to sacrifice anything else that uh, we didn't stop playing all of the music that we know and love, but we created space for us to do these new, these new things. And my, my time in Omaha, you know, it's a much smaller city, much smaller community, but still an orchestra that was coming up on celebrating 100 years and really thinking about what can this orchestra uniquely do for its community and making sure that we're able to speak to younger and older generations in a way that's really, really fascinating. We, we would uh, do a show with a band called Guster and we recorded and released that as an album that did really well. Um, but then we would also do things with um, like a night of Motown. And then we would also have, you know, like a, you know, a night full of Beethoven's music. So it was, it was really thinking about how do we capture all segments of our audience? We know that there aren't people like, you, I, I like to equate it to something similar, like, you know, like if I were on NBC, right. And I know that I have an audience that likes comedy. I know that I have an audience that likes drama. I know that I have an audience that likes reality television. And if we said that we're only going to serve comedy, then we're missing entire segments of the audience base. And then we know that we can build in layers to that and really think through like there are going to be people that like younger comics and younger up and coming artists. And then there are going to be people that like, you know, a more established and, and we can, we have time, space and opportunity to serve all of those groups. So here so you're, you're you're taking a portfolio management approach to programming mm -hmm. so that yes. you are, are purposefully looking at your audience and their taste. And you're saying, OK, we're not just going to serve, to, to take your analogy, news all day. Right. Mm -hmm. We're not just going to serve comedy all day. 
we're not just going to serve Beethoven or Brahms or Mozart all day, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to actually mix it up. So, so talk a little bit about how that manifests in a way that connects to audiences that actually attract family with kids, for example, or that, that attracts the traditionalists or that, that attracts the people who are walking in and they want to listen to something unusual that's challenging, that has that verve. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you program for that? Absolutely. So I think this is one of the advantages that um, that orchestras have in the traditional Western European art forms that we have that say opera, ballet, ballet to some extent, but but dance, uh, theater don't have, right? Because we can have three, four, five, six pieces of music on one night. Uh, right. So that allows us to be able to say, well, if you're into, into new music, then we have this piece for you. And we're going to pair this with something that is going to be, you know, a, a war horse, so to speak. So we're going to be able to serve two audience groups there. We're able to, there at this point, we have some very wonderful family programs that have been done time and time again. And I, I think through that, that, you know, growing up with a, a, such wonderful music that was featured in cartoons and featured in, you know, that gets played in commercials and things like that. So their children are being exposed to wonderful music um, and we just have to be able to present it to them. And when you connect the dots and make it accessible for them, then it becomes wonderful. I think that parents are always looking for something just um, educational and fun to do with their children. And we like to be able to, to, to do that. But then when we start looking at younger and more diverse audiences, we think about like, okay, well, what role does like maybe movies play? And how do we how do we connect those specific movies to those audiences and knowing, OK, well, what's working, what's not working? And we can't just say like as one and I'm, I'm a big Star Wars fan, but as, as lovely as those are, you know, that's a that's a specific demographic. And we can continue to serve those because now we have nine of them <laughs> in order that we could do. Right. But then we there are new ones that are coming up. Like I think, you know, obviously Black Panther is touring now, which I think is really fantastic. Um so you have, there's you, you, this lemony snicket thing that's that's yeah, uh, that's absolutely. going on. So yeah. there you have the composer is dead mm -hmm. by um, uh, music by Nathaniel uh, Stuckey and the words by Lemony Stick is Snicket. Yep. That is exactly. that amazing. Yeah, so it's it's really really fun to be able to do things like that that I think really allow us to connect to like stories that that people know and love and connect that with music and then feel like it's it, we're creating an ecosystem for them in a place that they can feel comfortable. And so that feels really, really good for us. How many of your colleagues across the uh, classical music field are, uh, are black and male and young? I would say that there's, there's a handful of us, which is, which is really, really fortunate. When I came into my role uh, about a year or so ago, I think that there were maybe three or four um, that were in smaller orchestras than, than the one that I'm in. And now there are several that are uh, across the country. And even we have one in Canada now, which I think is really, really fantastic. But it's, it's, it's a growing space. People are feeling like maybe we need to try something a little bit different and make sure that people are seeing that the organization is ready, willing, and able to make a change and giving us an opportunity to lead. We have, we have the abilities to do so. We just haven't been given the opportunity. So it, it feels really, I feel really fortunate to be, be amongst a group of, of very, very smart and talented uh, leaders of orchestras that are also, you know, black and brown. Is your, is your connection to the audience that comes out of your own lived experience as a younger person, as, as uh, male, as, as uh, being black, um, and other aspects of who you are, do you feel that, that, that this actually allows this, uh, this symphony and, and others that you work with to benefit from a different way of thinking so that you have a lot more different threads of thoughts and traditions that inform this very classical music? Is this, is this part of enlivening this to, to have these different choices and ideas rather than having everybody coming from one place? Absolutely. I think it's, I think it's critical to have not only diversity of thought, but diversity in your, the people that you have around the table. We know that we benefit from having different textures and different approaches to things. And when we, when we look at how we approach programming, how we approach fundraising, how we approach community engagement, when you have people that can speak from different lived experiences, that only makes the, that only makes the opportunities 
broader and better. I, I I was having a conversation with with a with a colleague of mine uh, or two colleagues of mine last week about how America is always uses the term like a melting pot, right? That everybody comes in and they um, they get to go in and then they just make something new out of it, right? And I said I always struggle with that term and I did, I couldn't figure out why. And and my colleague told me I know exactly why you say that you have a problem with it is because a melting pot you kind of lose who you are in that. And she's, she's from, she's from New Orleans. And she said, it's more like a gumbo where all of these pieces come into, like you have your sausage, you might have your shrimp, your chicken, your, uh, your rice and your vegetables, and they all come in. They don't lose who they are, but they all come together to make something really special. And you know, I, I couldn't agree more. You know, I look at it also as an alloy, right? An <laughs> alloy, which is stronger because of the combination of substances, metals, and so on, carbon exactly. to create something, right? It doesn't, those, those molecules don't lose their identity. Mm-hmm. They just function in their own way to, to make things stronger. Gumbo, right? You, you eat a gumbo and you have these bursts of flavor, right? All mm-hmm. over the place, but it's not mush, Right. No, exactly. Open, right. <laughs> yeah. And so, so that character, that distinctive character. Talk about your musicians. Do do your musicians sometimes traverse different styles, or do they they each keep strictly into the traditions of you know French horn or trumpet or violin that is within that particular orchestral three hundred year old segment of yeah. music. Our, our musicians come from come from many different. Uh, they have many different passions, and I would say that there's a really wonderful opportunity here because many of them will go in and they'll play. Um, they'll play with other artists, and they'll come in. They uh, a lot of them will go in and they'll play with the Who. They'll play with uh, many other people that'll come into town, which I think is really really fantastic. At, at they'll play at jazz fest. They'll play at French Quarter Fest. Some of them will take Mardi Gras gigs, and and which I think is really really fantastic. But then also they they have their own ensembles, which I think is wonderful too. So they come together and play the music that is also meaningful for them. So when you take you know a seventy piece orchestra and now you break it down into a quartet or a trio, um, then it allows them to get in the spaces, which is really, really helpful. Um, and I think that they also bring that level of, of musicianship back to the orchestra when they come together to play as a whole. You know, they'll go off and they'll work as studio musicians, which I think also sharpens their technique in new ways, because now you're you're playing music that's going to be featured in a, in a commercial or a film. And the, the, the music is different, you know, because you might be the only one there and you're, you're very, uh, you know, for lack of a good term, very exposed in those moments. And it gives them a, a unique opportunity to really hone in on their own skill set. And then when they, when they come back to us, there is this sense of like they're all better musicians because that they're taking all of these additional opportunities for them to continue to fulfill their own artistic desires, which I think is really, really wonderful. So you're not a supporter of everybody staying in their own lane, and and no. um, and and if if you're in marketing, you stay in marketing, and if you're in development, you stay in development, and if you're if you're um, you're scheduling performances, you stay in. Uh, are you when you bring your team together? How does your team function? So that you also have the benefit of these cross fertilizing ideas that you were just referencing amongst mm-hmm. your musicians. Yeah, it's 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 a really wonderful opportunity for us to all come together. And I think that you know one thing we try to do is make sure that everybody stays in the loop on everything. You know, like I said, there's a there's a the the collaboration is baked into who we are as an organization, which I think allows us to just not have to force it. It just is there. Uh, so we have a lot of committees that will come together and meet pretty frequently to say, is this working? Is this not working? What do we want to do? What do we want to be? How do we want to impact the community? And we'll, they're always, like I said, always musicians, always staff, always trustees. And what that does is that, you know, we're always thinking about it from the specific chair that we're in. So then that way, when I come to the table, you know, I'm representing, you know, my my role here. Um, and when our musicians come, they say, okay, well, you know, this music doesn't challenge us enough or you're not thinking big enough. And then our trustees may come in and say, oh, well, wouldn't it be great? Or I know someone who, you know, they get to do they get to say, I know someone who might support this, who might be thinking about um, this is a new community for us to be a part of. And how do we bring all of these things together? It really is really fantastic for us because it's it's so thoughtful and committed and very organic. It never feels forced, which is really, really helpful. How do you define excellence in this, in this kind of a circumstance? Because mm-hmm. very often excellence is defined as staying in your lane and being increasingly narrow but deep. 
right? Mm -hmm. In which case that creates a preconception of what a talent should look like. Now, that preconception might mean that a particular person, a Yasha Heifetz, for example, mm -hmm. has amazing technique in that person's field. But if you take them out of that particular narrow area where they are undoubtedly excellent, they could not necessarily compete using that same instrument, but in a different style, in which case you end up relegating the style of music to a very narrow type of, of, of ways of playing it, right? Mm -hmm. So if you, if you look at how you assess talent, right, your, your uh, musicians are very much skew out of the European uh, traditions of symphony orchestras, which are uh, dominated by white musicians, right? Yes. Your, your management team might have a particular um, literal complexion or a particular literal age, right, that comes out of these traditions. How do you break the mold while honoring the traditional skills yet not holding yourself hostage to just the traditional skills and allowing new skills to enliven and change and transform who yeah. you are, what you play. How do we transform America? I mean, we're asking a bigger question than just symphonies. How do we, how do we deal with this? Anwar? Yeah, I th it's, a, it's a fantastic question. And, and I think that there are times where, you know, excellence, perfectionism is necessary. You know, to be able to achieve something and do it really well, it is really important. But you you have to be able to line up a space where you really can be innovative and creative and push there. You know, there, there's a phrase that is, you know, um, where good enough is great enough. <laughs> and it's just say, OK, how do we how do we get to this point where we can say, is this good enough for what we need to do? Is it ever going to be exactly perfect? Maybe, maybe not. But we, one thing that I that I try to make sure that that we're very thoughtful about is when the art is happening on stage, right, or in the community, however it may be, right. Like there, there will be times where it's not exactly perfect because we are not robots, you know, and we have to realize that this is a, we are living, breathing human beings, and we'll do everything to the best of our power to get it to be exactly what we want it to be. However we know that there are, it's going to be a little bit different and that's okay because you were in the room at this unique point in time. And as long as you enjoyed it, then we're going to be okay. So when I think about the innovation, I, I try to think through, all right, well, what can we build around maybe the art to push us and evolve us forward? We have a concert that we're doing with big Frida um, next year. Who's a, who's a bounce artist from new Orleans. Um, and, and as far as I know, and as far as we know, no one has ever paired or an or orchestra with a, with a, with bounce music. Um, so for me, I start to think through like, okay, well, what steps do we need to put into place to make sure that this is actually going to be a truly authentic experience for the people that know and love her music? And I say, okay, well, what, what things do we normally do as an orchestra to get there? Right. We make sure that we have great charts. We make sure that we have an opportunity for us to listen uh, and to to hear it beforehand, to to make sure that we're going to do some reading sessions. We're going to maybe maybe record it and go back and listen to it and really connect back in a way that allows us to think through we're honoring who we are, but also honoring them and their the traditional the bounce traditions as well. So we we were thinking like, okay, well, do we need to have this be a a seated audience or does this need to be an audience that's going to be able to stand up and dance? And ultimately we decided to go back to having a seated audience. We said if people want to get up and dance, they're going to get up and dance. They're not going to wait for us to give them a, a green light to go. It's just going to happen naturally. And we just wanted to make sure that we had it available as an option for people. So really thinking through like we have to we can innovate on one side of the aisle or the other and that's okay and that's going to push us forward and allow us to reapproach allow us to approach things in new and creative ways and that is going to just be we're going to have to live in a world of you know perfect imperfection so to speak i love it perfect imperfection i love the experimentation i love the idea of looking at your repertoire as a portfolio of different experiences I love the interactions amongst the artists, your management team, the artistic director, your board, the community, and, and this whole idea of 
if you're going to improvise, you're going to blow a bad note every once in a while. That's also part of the process, right? If you're not blowing a bad note every once in a while, you're just not trying hard enough. Exactly. <laughs> I want to see her. Thank you so much. What a great set of ideas that will guide us not only in our arts lives, but also in just our civil society lives. You and your orchestra, Louisiana Philharmonic Orchestra, are really a real model for us all. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. Please thank your team, your artists, your artistic director, your board, and your community for really giving us the gift of, of, of your wisdom that we can share today. Thank you, Mark. I really appreciate you having me. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. Take care.